Let me thank God that we've been able to assemble today and to thank Reverend Sharpton and the National Action Network and all of the conveners that actually are here today. And most of all, these families that have been impacted by police brutality and misconduct. So we've come to bear witness, to remain awake, to remember from where we've come and to carefully consider where we're going. Whether you are here in person, online, or watching on MSNBC and other networks, thank you for joining us for this March on Washington. Together, we are taking a stand and we are taking a giant step forward. Let me also thank Al Green for the very, very warm introduction, my dear friend. But we're taking a step forward on America's rocky but righteous journey towards justice. August 28th is a day to remember the triumphs and tragedies that have taken place in our historic struggle for racial justice. Today, we commemorate the March on Washington to jobs and freedom in 1963, where my father declared his dream. But we must never forget the American nightmare of racist violence exemplified when Emmett Till was murdered on this day in 1955 and the criminal justice system failed to convict his killers. 65 years later, we still struggle for justice, demilitarizing the police dismantling mass incarceration and declaring and determinately as we can that black lives matter. In our struggle for justice, there are no permanent victories. For on this day, 12 years ago, I was honored to address the Democratic National Convention in Denver. And on that night, in that evening in the Mile High City, our spirits were soaring as the Democrats nominated Barack Obama, who would go on to become the first African-American president of these United States. But the progress we celebrated then is imperiled yet again. And now we must march to the ballot box and the mailboxes to defend the freedoms that earlier generations worked so hard to win. In so many ways, we stand together today in the symbolic shadow of history. But we are making history together right now. We're marching with the largest and most active multi-generational, multi-racial movement for civil rights since the 1960s. From high school students to senior citizens, black as well as white, Latino, Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islanders, Americans are marching together, many for the first time, and we're demanding real, lasting, structural change. We are marching together for time-honored goals and in timely ways. We are courageous, but conscious of our health. We are socially distant, but spiritually united. We are making, masking our faces, but not our faith in freedom and we are taking our struggle to the streets and to social media. The nation has never seen such a mighty movement, a modern day incarnation of what my father called the coalition of conscience. And if we move forward with purpose and passion, we will complete the work so boldly began in the 1960s. We're marching to overcome what my father called were the triple evils of poverty, racism and violence. And today, those evils have exacerbated four major challenges that currently face our country. First, COVID-19 tragically has killed more than 175,000 Americans, disproportionately African-American, and Latino and low-income people in every background. Second, more than 30 million Americans are unemployed again, disproportionately people of color. 
COVID-19 has laid bare the structural and racial inequalities in our economy that kept too many people trapped in the debt and poverty. Third, police brutality and gun violence are killing so many unarmed African Americans. Today, we march with their families and we say their names. George Floyd, Boham Jean, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Yusef Richardson, Terrence Crutcher, Trayvon Martin, Ahmad, Ahmad, Ahmad uh, Av Avery, Elijah McClain, and so many others. And fourth, our voting rights are under attack. We must vigorously defend our right to vote because those rights were paid for with the blood of those lynched for seeking to exercise their constitutional rights. They were paid for with the blood of civil rights workers, such as Sammy Young, Jr., Goodman, Swerney, and Cheney, Jimmy Lee Jackson, Viola Luizzo, James Reed. Those rights were paid for through the sacrifices made by heroes such as C.T. Vivian, Fannie Lou Hamer, Hosea Williams, and John Lewis. But since the United States Senate has failed to renew the Voting Rights Act, we have had to overcome a whole new trick bags of tactics to suppress our votes, discriminatory voter ID requirements, cutbacks in early voting and vote by mail, voter purges targeting those who have missed several elections, and disenfranchising those who have served their time and paid their debt to the society. And now COVID-19 is making it dangerous, even deadly, to stand in line at polling places. We shouldn't have to risk our lives to cast our votes. We need to be able to do what President Trump does, vote safely by mail. But now we are struggling to overcome the dismantling of the U.S. Postal Service for the express purpose of suppressing our vote. With all these threats to our lives and liberties, our challenge is to use this moment to expand this movement, a movement that not only raises its voice, but casts its votes, pursues its vision, and makes lasting change. The scripture says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Our vision is best expressed, expressed by a phrase we must never forget, that is, the beloved community. With those words, my father, John Lewis, Ella Baker, Rosa Parks, and so many other historic women and men envision an America whose dramatic practice is as good as its promise, an America where the triple evils of poverty, racism, and violence will be replaced by peace, justice, and shared abundance, and where hate and fear finally give way to help and love. To achieve that America, we need to raise our voices and cast our votes. Over the weeks ahead, culminating on Election Day, we need to vote as if our lives and our livelihoods, our liberties depend on it, because they do. No person, no people are more keenly aware of the risk of disenfranchisement than those who have suffered from it. There is a knee upon the neck of democracy, and our nation can only live so long without the oxygen of freedom. The strength must be exercised by more than rhetoric and more than marching. The simple challenge before us is that everyone can cast a ballot and everyone who can must cast a ballot. And that ballot that is cast must be counted and the result must, must be transparent and known to the whole world. And so today, I can call on everyone with the means to drive people to the polls, to make a plan for yourself, for your family and your neighbor, for those organizations and companies that care about democracy. I call on you today to offer your resources and your capacity to make sure every ballot is to count it. If our forefathers were willing to die for the right to vote, we can work for the right to vote. And I will continue to call on you to act in the coming days. You know, my father was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, while standing in solidarity with poor working people, sanitation workers, whose slogans, I am a man, was a statement 
that they were human beings with rights that should be respected and acknowledged. They were asking for safe working conditions, for a living wage, for recognition of their union, and for human dignity. They summed up their struggle with those four words, I am a man. That simple but powerful slogan impairs movements today from Black Lives Matter to fight for 15 and to the Me Too struggle against sexual harassment and abuse. Movements of marginalized Americans are still trying to claim the dignity they've been denied. Martin Luther King Jr. fought for the dignity of work, and that fight is never ending. In 1963, the March on Washington demanded jobs and freedoms. In 1968, the Memphis sanitation strike workers and de demanded and the Poor People's Campaign insisted that working people should not live and labor in poverty. Those fights foreshadowed our struggle today to make the minimum wage a living wage, not a poverty wage. And we are fighting alongside the frontline workers, sanitation workers, healthcare workers, grocery workers, transport workers, food service workers, and so many more. They are praised for being essential, but they are treated as if they're expendable. While standing with sanitation workers in Memphis, Dad said, so often we overlook the work and the significance of those who are not in professional jobs, of those who are not in the so-called big jobs. But let me say to you tonight, that wherever you are or whenever you are engaged in work that serves humanity and is for the building of humanity, it has dignity and worth. Now we have a president who confesses greatness with grandiosity. But my father knew better. Everyone, he said, can be great because everyone can serve. He understood the human yearning for recognition. And in his famous speech, he explained that everyone wants to be a drum major, the leader of the marching band. And he challenged us to channel our drum major instinct into becoming drum majors for justice. While we honor our history, we must be living a living movement, not a monument. If Dad were here today, I'm sure he would implore us not to deify him or selectively quote him when convenient. He would want us to be drama majors for justice, to champion the ideals he promoted, racial justice, social equality, and peace. And he would gently but intently challenge us not to dwell upon the past, but to live and labor in what he called the fierce urgency of now. So if you're looking for a savior, get up and find a mirror. We must become the heroes of the history we are making. And us means all of us. In 1963, after my father spoke, Bayard Rustin, the architect of the march, asked the participants to join and demanded that Congress pass strong civil rights and voting rights laws. More than half a century later, we must demand that the United States Senate stop blocking passage of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Restoration Act. And so when we conclude today, let's remember that it remember that it, this is the commitment march in the spirit of 1963. I ask you to join me in pledging to act in three ways. First, because our civil and human rights are at stake in this election, I ask you not only to register and vote, to make sure that at least one other person registers and votes. Second, I ask you to commit to service and struggle in your community, from voter registration to raising the minimum wage to demilitarizing the police. Get involved with one or more of many worthwhile struggles in your community. And third, I ask you to pledge, as my father and John Lewis did, to get into good trouble and do it nonviolently. Remember that in the fight against injustice, nonviolence doesn't mean passive acceptance. It means peaceful resistance. We must come together and join with the Black Lives Movement to raise our voices and say enough is enough. We must come with the Poor People's Campaign, the Climate Change and Environmental Justice Movement, the Women's March and Me Too Movement, the Parkland Students and March for Our, no a march for our Lives, and say enough is enough. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, 
that the moral arc of the universe is long but bends toward justice. But he was also the first to say that it doesn't bend on, it on its own. We must do some work ourselves. In the final year of his life, he wrote in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? Well, my sisters and brothers and dear friends, in this defining moment for our history and our country, we must answer Dr. King's question. Will our answer be chaos or community? I believe some have chosen the answer with chaos, including the current occupant in the White House today. But we who believe must choose community because if we choose community, we can avoid watching the dream turn into a permanent nightmare. If we choose community, 50 years from now, people will say that we were able to redeem the soul of America and begin to fulfill the promise of democracy by systematically eliminating systematic racism and exploitation. My friends, if we choose community, we will be able to answer in the affirmative to the scripture. Here comes that dreamer. Come, let's slay him, and we shall see what will become of his dream. Finally, this afternoon, I want to say to you, not only do I come as a protester, but I come as a victim. My daddy was killed when I was 10 years old. Gunned down, you know that, by assassin's bullet. Some of you know, but may not know. Six years later, my daddy's mother, my grandmother, was gunned down in the church while playing the Lord's Prayer. So I understand what it means to lose a loved one. But I'm so thankful that my grandfather and my mother and my aunts and uncles taught me about love because granddaddy used to say, I refuse to allow any person to reduce me to hatred. The man that killed my lovely wife and the man that killed my son, I refuse to allow them even to reduce me to hatred. I love everybody, I'm every man's brother. If we're gonna resolve these issues in America, we've gotta come together. Dad talked about it in that sermon, Levels of Love. He talked about all of them. I'm only gonna talk about the highest level of love. That love that seeks nothing in return. That love that is totally unselfish. You love someone if they're young, you love them if they're old. You love them if they're black, you love them if they're white. You love them if they're Native American. You love them if they're Hispanic or Latino American. You love them if they're African. You love them if they're Asian. You love them because you know that God calls you to do that. And if we're going to resolve all of these conflicts and crises in America, we got to find a way to do it in love. Thank you and God bless you. And let's keep on keeping on.